How's that? Is that? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Okay. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, Munich Dunkel. Uh, you, you maybe wouldn't think, especially by the look of them, that it would have a lot of similarities to uh, the Oktoberfest and Metz and one that Daz was talking about. But I, th I think as we go on, uh, there will be a, a surprising amount of commonalities between the two. Uh, so this is 8A in the BJCP in dark lagers. The history of Dunkel is maybe a bit hard to uh, pick apart be, because from what I can tell, I think it is a derivation of what you might think of as like the proto or er uh, style uh, from pre-industrialization and pre Reinheitsgebot, where uh, the vast majority of the beers being drunk would have been dark uh, because of the way people were drying their malts before uh, coke fired malt kilning was uh, developed and popularized at the beginning of the 19th century. So if people were malting and, and a, a key part of that process is drying it out and sometimes that would have been using wood or, or, or straw or uh, a fuel for the fire to uh, dry it because especially in Germany you're not going to be able to sun dry your malt for very much of the time uh, and that will darken the malt quite considerably so pale beers would have been rare if if they occurred at all so uh, when these developments came in with the drying process and pale malt began to uh, be more available and the use of hydrometers meant that you could actually measure how much extract you're getting from the malt. People tended to discover that pale malt gave you proportionally more extract than the, the darker, heavily kilned malts that almost everyone would be using before. That's when the style started to become an actual style rather than just a, a visual description of the darkness of the beer. So then you're starting to, uh, uh, in, in London and England, for instance, porters would have started using pale malt because it was cheaper to get the strength you wanted and then using very black malt to get the color that you need. Uh, in Germany, uh, Sedelmeyer at Spartan Brewery uh, was developing a different kind of malting and kilning that was very similar, but uh, developed that the right amount of darkness and roastingness that he needed for the style without being too dark and destroying the potential extract of it. So before then, Dunkel, uh, as a term that means dark, would have applied more generally. And some people have said that in Germany, in some places in Germany, at least, that's, that can still sometimes be true if you just go into a bar and ask for a Dunkel. Uh, apparently, in some places, that can refer to any sort of dark beer, but definitely around Bavaria, uh, it would have meant this specific type of Munich Dunkel that we're discussing here. Uh, it was an incredibly popular style for a, uh, a surprisingly long amount of time. Uh, even up to the uh, like the late 20th century, it was the most popular style uh, around Bavaria. And it's only comparatively recently that pale lagers have uh, driven it out, I've been told. I don't know that <laughs> as a first-hand fact, I'm afraid. Uh, so the overall impression from the BJCP is that it is a multi-brown lager. And I think that's... Uh, one of the key things. It's uh, toasting, bready, uh, and as opposed to what we might think of as a dark beer, you're not getting any roasty, uh, ashy, burnt, any of those dark flavours that we might associate with a, a stout or a porter. It's uh, looking at more toffee, end of the scale, like toasted bread, um, the, the bitterness on it should be quite restrained and it's highly, 
highly drinkable. It's a good drinking beer. I know that sounds like it should be a bit of a tautology, but uh, not all beers are quite as quite as good at drinking as they should be, perhaps. But this is a style that is very much for yeah consuming. The statistics you're looking at uh, the the BJCP lists the original gravity from uh, 1048 to 1056. Uh, as we said with the Mertzen, uh, it's probably easier to look at that in degrees Plato. So this would have been what the Germans considered like a medium strength beer between about 12 and 14 degrees. It should finish quite dry with a sort of moderate I, uh, IBU. Uh, the, oh, what a moderate ABV, sorry. The IBU is actually quite interesting because the BJCP allows up to 28 which I think was more bitter than the Mertzen, which is uh, a bit weird. I think if you're if you're bittering it more than the Mertzen, maybe have a, another think about that. Uh, the the colour of it, it again, it's slightly surprising. The colour is probably lower than I think people might generally expect. If you think of Dunkel and dark, you might be thinking almost black but it's, uh, it's the highest end of the color uh, allowable on this is actually lower than black. So if, you, if you've made it Guinness black, uh, that's gone too far actually. And it can be even at the low end of the scale, what you would call brown, frankly, rather than dark. So there's a few, a few, um, pitfalls perhaps in the specifications that uh, might not be obvious at first sight. Uh, I put some pictures in because Dad's put some pictures in his. Uh, it's, not, uh, it's not as common a beer as perhaps it should be. Uh, off the top of my head, I couldn't think of any, uh, any of the uh, uh, big breweries uh, in the UK that were regularly putting out. I think Utopian has uh, a dark lager. They don't call it a Dunkel. I think it's more Dunkel than, for, from what I could tell from the Utopian thing, it was, uh, they seem to be presenting it as more like a Czech dark lager, but on trying it, I, I felt it was more like a Dunkel than that. It was, it was nice. <laughs> it was a good one. But in terms of the classics, uh, the classic Bavarian breweries, uh, the Altbayerisch Dunkel is incredible. It's, uh, it's probably one of the beers that I, if you said you could have a, a constant free supply of, uh, yeah, just get that in and it's a lovely one. Uh, the ingredients, the, the key thing with the ingredients is, is restraint. Uh, it's not a style where you should be, I, I believe, I'm, I'm going to go a bit off uh, the strict facts and maybe put in a bit of uh, opinion. I, I don't think it's something you should be throwing a lot of, uh, a lot of ingredients in or a lot of uh, strong flavoured in, ingredients either. The traditional grist is 100% Munich malt uh, from back in the day. Most of the recipes I found, we'll talk a little about the recipes in a bit. Almost all the recipes deviate from this uh, and somewhat, but I would say if you're, you're planning your own recipe in this, I would say to start with Munich malt and try and deviate as little as possible from that. Uh, if you find yourself trying to add like roasted or black malts to bring your color up to where it be, then you have fallen from the path of righteousness there you hew to the uh, true line keep it as much as possible very very simple uh, in terms of other additions to the grist uh, pilsner and vienna malts uh, seem to be quite common and often crystal to get that um, toffee uh, caramel flavor but then as we were talking about with the Mertzen it's very easy to go too far on that and make up with ingredients what you should, I think, be nailing with process. Uh, this is a simple beer. I think 
done well rather than trying to catch up with yourself with uh, 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 recipe selections. Hops, even simpler, pick a, uh, a good German noble hop and put very little of it in. Uh, you should bitter uh, probably to about the low 20s uh, and then at maybe some 30 minute or uh, 20 minute additions, but later than that uh, should probably be avoided. Uh, there's some things here that I think will be pretty much the same as Mets and things like the yeast selection, the water selection and the lagering. Same as Mets and same as everything. Uh, you just do it in the Bavarian way. I think it's uh, if you kept everything the same when you're making German lagers in, in these respects, I don't think you go too far wrong. Um, when you're choosing your yeast, the same considerations as the Mertz and apply, I think you should choose something fairly malt focused with good attenuation. But apart from that, I think you've got a fair bit of scope. You're not going to go desperately wrong unless you're, I don't know, unless you pitch some Philly sour or something, you're, you're probably going to mm -hmm. get it all right. Water, I, I, again, the same, keep it soft. Uh, at the moment, my process now is to start with RO water. And uh, in fact, I've copied this exactly from Daz's one. I meant to change that <laughs> and it turns out I haven't, but it's fine because the same principle applies. Uh, my process I think is to start with RO water and then just put calcium chloride in until you get about 50 parts per million of calcium. And not, I think I stole that from James as well. I think you can't really go too far wrong with that. Uh, a uh, key thing is the process. Uh, I think Daz was right about the, the Mertz and Mass schedule. I don't think it's generally a decocted style. When he said that, I'm like, oh, but it must be. And no, I think it's right. I, I don't think it often is. And I looked up and I didn't even decoct my last one. So that must be uh, the thing. But with, if you're, if you ever wanted to try a decoction, I would say this is going to be one of the one of the big ones where it's going to make a big impact. Uh, I think this and Doppelbox even more than uh, Czech Pilsners, uh, the decoction is going to be a massive help and advantage. I think that's where you're making up a lot of the, the richness and the complexity that people are trying to get with those crystal additions. Uh, but if you try and do it with ingredients, you get that sort of cloying, heavy mouthfeel, uh, which you, you don't tend to get with decoctions. So, uh, yes, yeah, seriously consider it, I would say. That would be uh, my, my big opinion on this. If you can't or won't do a decoction, I would say a step mash is uh, almost uh, as important here because with the simplicity of the ingredients, that this is how you get that. Um, sorry. So you're looking at a single decoction, double, triple, or uh, as many it, as it, you can tolerate? Yeah, yeah, I would say as many as you can. I, I would look at a triple decoction with this. Um, yeah, I, I, I think it, it, it it's gonna form, the, the beer I'm imagining in my head, it's going to form such a, a backbone of that. that yeah, if, if you're going to do a decoction at all, go all in on this one, I would say. Cool. Uh, yeah, boiling. I think people boil quite long with this for a lot of the same reasons to uh, maybe impart a hint of caramelization of Maillard products on that. Um, and very, very simple hot schedule, as we talked about before, uh, 60 and 30 minutes, almost certainly sufficient for that. Fermentation, again, same, just do it Bavarian style, uh, as, as low as your yeast will tolerate, basically, and for as long as you can get away with. Um, what I'm 
doing at the moment is I, I pitch it quite low at about nine degrees. Uh, then when I start to see activity, let it rise to about 10. And then over a course of about three or four days, let it rise up to about 12. Uh, there's the, um, the Braukaiser method where when you get to about half attenuation, the, uh, the benefits of the low fermentation temperature aren't as uh, important. So you can let it rise up to um, a more traditional ale temperature without uh, too much uh, side effects or bad products coming from there. And that will help speed things up. And again, lagering uh, just as long and low as you, as you think you can get away with. Uh, I'd aim for a, at least three weeks. Uh, in order to uh, round off some of those uh, malt flavors. But like, again, traditionally you were looking at half a year. I, I, I don't think that's necessary. And I think after about two or three months, you'll probably see very diminishing returns, but yeah, as, as pretty much same as fermentation as long and, and as low as you uh, can get away with. Most of the recipes I came across uh, deviated from what I would consider the truth and the way. Uh, so my my one that I I, I did uh, got a, a second on the table at uh, Larkin and Life. I uh, it's basically a smash. I used the the Barker Munich that uh, James was talking about before, and, and then just. Mittelfrau uh, did a triple decoction with that uh, and the uh, Munich Heller's yeast, which I think is quite a rare one. I don't think it comes around much, very often. I th and I think the reason I decided to brew this is because I saw it on Malt Miller and thought it would be a go. So yeah, that one came out much better than I was expecting, to be honest. It was, it was I quite enjoyed that, I should brew it again. Uh, it, by comparison, things like uh, the Brew Your Best uh, Munich Dunkel, the craft beer and brewing magazine do a series on these. They've uh, rounded out the Munich with Victory and Carafa 2. Uh, Carafa was quite a common addition for, for darkening uh, and roasting things. I think people always want to put some dark malts in and if you if you feel you really must put some dark malts in things like carafe are better i think they're de-husked so uh you you'll get slightly less of that ashy um uh, uh drying bitterness compared to something like black barley or something like that which is is going to give you completely the wrong uh thing uh, and in the article that they wrote, uh, he, he, did, he did make the same point that uh, the, the malt beer should be quite restrained, but I would, I would go for further restraint than that. Uh, again here, oh, sorry. The, uh, he's bittered with Nugget and, and Tetnang, a uh, five minute edition. It's, only, it's probably quite a small edition, but yeah, I'd, I'd say that was quite, that that would be later than I would do, but I'm sure it's nice. Tetang is not going to give you too much, uh, too much trouble with that. Uh, by comparison, the brew your own recipe uh, ha has used quite a lot of different malt and some dark ones as well. Uh, probably trying to develop that. Uh, that range of richness and complexity. Uh, and, and the hop schedule is, yeah. Oh, I think the SARS is at 20 minutes as well, actually. I think I've written that wrong. Uh, so there, there's, there's a range of different options. Uh, a lot of the other recipes I, set, I found and didn't include, like the Mets and one you were talking about where people are just throwing every everything in at it, which I think is, it's not going to give you the best example. Uh, but yeah, that is that is everything. Thank you. Yeah, I think with the, the recipes, you can 
if you simplify, then you can add complexity later on. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you throw everything in the kitchen sink in, it's like, well, how do I change this? It's less easy to know. And I do think particularly with the Barker Munich or Barker Malts, you get so much out of them anyway. It's just like make it with that and make it as a smash. Yeah. And then next time, double decoct it or add some whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think it's much easier to do it that way round to try it and go, oh, no, that's a bit flat. That's a bit lifeless. I need to add something more rather than to get a, like a muddy, mixed up, mangled mess and go, oh, well, what do I need to take out? To... Then, then you've got to, you're back to square one, really. But yeah, I think you're right. Start simple. And, and that, that BYO recipe there on the screen, that looks that looks like a, a sort of a bit of an old school homebrew recipe yeah. where everything is like pills them all and then add some chocolate and crystal yeah, yeah. and stuff like that loads of, <laughs> loads of quite dark crystal as well <laughs> yeah yeah it, it's quite uh like if you, i i think if you showed that malt beer to someone may, maybe the pilsner is a bit of a giveaway but apart from that that's like typical british beer kind of thing like Yeah, the chocolate seems an odd one to me. Hmm. Like I can see why you would like you would think that it was a good idea. Like when, when you read the, the impression of the beer uh, and, and what sort of flavors you're expecting, you could say, oh yeah, chocolate malt, that'll give it a lovely creamy, warm. I, I'm I would be surprised, I think, if it came out like that. Yeah, I would say maybe. Maybe some 120 Levy Bond crystal. Mm. Oh, whilst you're on it, um, there is also another recipe on our wiki uh, from Lee, uh, who did, got a gold medal for his oaked dunkel uh, back at the ACB competition earlier on this year. Uh, ah. He got a third at Lab Open as well. Um, oh, exhaustive research must have missed that. Uh, well, it is kind of hidden down in the um, sort of special beers and stuff like that. Uh, I'll put the link in. But yeah, um, that one was da, 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 um, well, I'm in Munich to nearly 90%, bit of melanoidin and a bit of carafa three, but only a tiny bit of carafa three. Um, and then used use, use WLP833. Otherwise, full as. Yeah, I mean, slightly, slightly higher IBUs, that sort of thing. But other than that, um, and then, yeah, he just, he took some of it off normally and then the rest, uh, and he oaked, added some uh, medium char oak spiral for a month. Um, yeah, I taste it. It was really good. Well, annoyed in sounds good. Save yourself 10 hours, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I've, I've not actually experimented much with melanoidin, mostly because I'm, I'm terrified that it will be exactly the same as doing decoctions. And um, basically my whole life will be a pointless lie. <laughs> but it won't so give you the same, that. it won't give you the same feeling of mental sort of well-being from standing <laughs> yeah, over a pot yeah. for six hours staring yeah, away. Meditative act yeah. of stirring a decoction. You're now held to ransom by your own evangelism. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's going to go all Jonestown by the end of this. It's... Cool. Well, uh, thank you guys. Thank you, Darren. Thank you, Rob. Uh, that was very informative. So, everybody, uh, a little round of applause. Um, I guess I would take out that. Like, uh, does anyone want to sort of summarise? the sort of comparison between the two styles where, where they sort of slightly differ? I think the main one for me is like they're very, very similar and it's the Dunkel is just decocted to give it a bit more complexity, a bit more caramelization. Other than that, there's not a lot in it. Yeah. I was going to say that. They're really interesting. The... the mm. The ingredients, the process, the IBUs, the co the color, almost even, were all very, very similar. And it always always strikes me with beer that you can have very similar 
set of ingredients and set of process but just a tweak will give you an entirely different beer. And the same with British beer, same with German beer. Anything really. Just got a little comparison here I can show. It's the Dunkel's chocolate here, isn't it? Like a darker medicine almost. So just in terms of the, um, uh, so we've got the, the medicine on the left and Dunkel on the right here. So it looks to me like, Dunkel is darker, but not as strong. Mm. Um, basically, mm. so uh, yeah, the mountain is is slightly stronger, sort of five point eight, six point three instead of four and a half to five point six. Um, but on the other hand, it's it's the mountain is is slightly lighter as well. Um, and in terms of experience. Um, Got the two here, so you get a lot of the same. A lot, otherwise, it is a lot of the same characters. Mm. I mean, if you took the color out of the equation, mm. yeah, there's maybe not even enough there to make them separate styles. Yeah, well, I think that yeah. the, the mountain is, should be slightly stronger. Yeah, um, and I would have said hoppier, but that's not reflected in the IBUs, for instance. No. Yeah, so hot, hot flavor is low to none. Yeah. Um, same for Dunkel. So, I mean, obviously, that's the BJCP. So, what do they know? <laughs> um, and yet, they do come across as very different beers mm, to drink. Yeah. I wonder if you blindfolded them, if it. Well, we'll get to try in, uh, when did I say? March? Yep. Hopefully. So yeah. Um, so everybody go away, you brew a a, a Dunkel or a Matson or whatever else you feel like. I mean, I guess you could have a, a bock or something like that if you really fancied it. Um we'll do as we did with the Vice beers a few months ago and uh taste our way through them all to try and see where they where they come. I think um from my experience at least, the yeast does make a big difference on this actually. A lot bigger than you'd expect. Um mm -hmm. Uh, I was just looking as well. The malt mill has the um, the WP860 that you used, Rob. Uh, they've yeah, got a few I'm valves on that one. Yeah. Um, but there are plenty, of, there are so many options when you look along the, the various um, yeast suppliers now as well. Um, so, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's many, many different choices for blends and so bock yeast, regular yeast. I'd, I'd stay away from the sort of more check yeasts um but yes yeah, so there's plenty of choice there is the character of the malt slightly different so that in the uh, mass and the character is a bit more bready and in the donkel it's a bit more toasty perhaps yeah oh uh, yeah definitely it's uh yeah the, the if you think the dunkel up here and the mats in there but also, I think there would be a, a fair degree of crossover on the on that spectrum as well. <laughs> if you have a particularly rich Metzen and a particularly light Dunkel, it, it could be the other way around. And that's the impression I get anyway. Right. Yeah, it's just some of the words I picked out on the description there. They were talking about bready and toasty. So I was just wondering maybe if that was one of the defining characters. Mm. Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would say so. In, like, definitely in general terms. Yeah. On that description of James, is uh, it was uh, if I caught it right, it said for the Metzens, the early Metzens were much darker, mm. which is interesting. I wonder if the two styles at that point, or yeah, I wonder if there would be two styles if they'd have stayed stayed darker. That's a good point. They may not have been two styles. <laughs> no, I mean, well, I mean, obviously, it was all very regional and. Yeah. Talking 500 yeah. years ago at the dawn of it, it was kind of uh, <laughs> Germany was different bits of different principalities and countries and things like that, wasn't it? So it was, uh, yeah, um, quite quite tricky to to say what came from where. Um, so, um, can I ask a question? Uh, something that James brought up. There, there seems to me between brewing water and um, uh, brew father 
it, they've obviously got different calculation um, methods because I haven't managed to get the pH to line up between the two, even when I put exactly the same additions in. Um, which which one out of the people that use both, which one would you rely on, brew and water or um, brew father? Um, just a question. <laughs> um brewing water these days i uh, the, i used to be very critical of it and i'm not now because i think he's he there the used to be big discrepancies around high um alkalinity water which is what we have in london and it didn't work very well with that um or very high roast uh grists but um he seems to have fixed all of that and I think a lot of it is down to um, uh, basically sort of empirical means he's basically gone away, tested it, tested it, tested it, and and adjusted the various sort of equations that are being used to calculate it because there's no there's no like official pH mash pH calculation equation. Um, it's very much, a, a, I think, the sort of go away, try it with various things, graph it out, and then create an equation to to match that curve. Um, so yeah, I from what I've seen, Bruin Water seems to be very good. But as always, test it, <laughs> see how it works for you, and um, and if it works, and it works. But for a while, I couldn't trust it. Um, but more recently, it does actually seem to be pretty much on the money um so yeah okay but i mean that it's all estimations as long as you're not up at like six or something like that or 5.9 then or down in the yeah, fours then you're fine i might have to take my ph meter out of its um pristine packaging and just that might not be a bad idea actually and then just adjust based on your own experience yeah i mean that that but you know the the dollop method um, uh, seems to have worked for the last twenty something odd years. So you know, you know, traditionalism. <coughs> yeah, I mean, uh, there's another reason: go simple, brew it simply, and then you can adjust next time you do it, which will, with whatever you think is wrong. Um, that, that, I, I must that, admit, I. I've been using brew and water and I had problems with it initially um, being a bit odd on res residual alkalinity. Um, and I think it's spot on now because um, I having checked back and so on, it's, it's pretty reliable. Um, certainly for mash pH. Okay. Thank you. So are you saying it's got more reliable over time because he's he's changed it rather than yeah. one, has, one has understood it a bit better because I find it I, I did find it quite complicated I'll, to get my brain round to begin if with. I remember I'll go back and I've got various versions of it over the last sort of mm -hmm. seven years so I'll go back and stick the same thing into it and see what happens but um yeah definitely early on it was a bit weird with uh, the sort of levels of alkalinity and stuff like that so we're kind of a bit at the extreme of things um albeit not extreme for historical brewing um but when i've used it much more recently the later versions is is good so. it's 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 very close between whatever the calculation is in brew father but it is different which is not unexpected so um do, do you think it make does it make a difference to the beer or is it just nice to know that it's more accurate well uh, it, it, if you put it in one spreadsheet or the other it's not going to make the beer taste different <laughs> <laughs> and, and and given the given all the other variables that are in in the beer trying to recreate the same one again uh yeah. it's unlikely i i just like to make sure i'm in the right range if i've got a dark beer i want it to be a mash ph a bit higher and if I've got a light beer, I like it a bit lower. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I was being slightly facetious, obviously. That's okay. <laughs> but I, I would be, you know, this this the same as everyone else. I think you want the best tool for each part of the job. I, I mean, I, 
I think the true thing is uh, just the um, sort of brewing test strips are not accurate enough then. If I, if I need you to just dip my elbow in and it's probably <laughs> fine. For or the any other part of the body as it comes to hands, do you? Yeah, stick the baby's head in, whatever, the, what? whatever they used to do in the old days. I started off with like the test strips and the trouble with that I have with them was that the, I don't know they're the sort of the narrow range pH strips and basically the color went on them from sort of dark yellow to light brown and when you've dipped it into a brown wort it's like <laughs> I've got no idea what color this is at the end of it. Yeah the problem is that men can only see 16 colors so shades forget it you need a pH meter. Men can do what now? They can only see 16 colors <laughs> women have colors names for colors that we can't even see wow I'm, I'm like window what, safe mode. What, what are you what are you drinking there <laughs> i'm having some of that well 16 might be an exaggeration yeah but the exactly. fact is that it's Same quite way. difficult to distinguish those colors between you know kind of ph 5.4 and 5.6 it's kind of the same color for most of us I mean, it looks different on the test sheet, but when you're looking at it in real life, how can you tell which one it is? I can't. Play a lot of video games back in the old days, Les. <laughs> 16 color video games. Wow, oh, that's that interesting. I like it. Yeah, that's no good. pH meter is a bit more, as long as it's calibrated, pH meter is far more kind of uh, reliable. I can read a number far easier than I can tell the difference in colors, that's for sure. But I also, for dark beers, I tend to add the roasted grains as a cold steep at the end of the boil or well into the boil. So it doesn't affect the mash at all. It's all pale mash. I've started doing that as well, actually. Um, and I had to, realized I had to take the dark bolts out of the, the mash calculation entirely. Yes. So you just leave yourself with the pale malt and not have any whatever chocolate or black or anything in your recipe that you're calculating so you just yeah, basically that's right. remove it right in terms of mash ph yeah absolutely mm. bypass even adding in that and just dripping some gravy browning or something so. <laughs> MMR. very traditional a dollop of caramel Yeah, it's much like asking, adding braining, um, gravy browning, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I've, I've got a uh, half a litre bottle of Brewer's Caramel I've had for donkey's years, and uh, occasionally I use it, but because it, you try and find what the uh, colour rating is for that, an EBC, it doesn't exist anywhere. I've, eventually, I think I've calculated it out, it's something like, like about 3,000 for Brewer's Caramel. You just need a tiny dollop in there. It really takes a small amount to change your color. I, I use a, a syringe. Yeah. Um, uh, and I would, if, if the beers come out too anemic, for whatever reason, perhaps two mil of, of uh, Parisian essence or gravy brownie, um, it's just enough to make it a look, look at a bit more beerish. It was caramel. So I've got a best before date of 1978 on it or something. It doesn't matter. It's, it's still perfectly good. I, I'm using um, a catering size, that's like a one gallon packet of Tate and Lyle's treacle that is now over 20 years old. <laughs> and it is still fine. There's not a slightest bit of mold anywhere in there. It tastes good. The missus used it in her, all her cooking and all her baking as well. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with it whatsoever. Good for you. <laughs> it's like instant vintage ale. Yeah. <laughs> but when, when my first test brew I did the other month, I thought, well, I'm, I'm prepared to put it down the drain. Uh, so I'm using grain. It's whole grain. And it's over three years old. It's been kept in airtight, you know, the, the uh, chutney barrels and the mango pickle barrels and things like that and you cannot taste any or I can't pick up any kind of sort of a old slack malt flavors from it whatsoever 
it, 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 it still tastes really, really fresh. Obviously, if you if I was to do a comparative brew with malt I buy tomorrow and do exactly the same brew, you're probably going to notice some slight de deviations there. But yeah, it certainly doesn't take I, I would slack malt. And I, I know over the years we've had people have brought beers into lab and we've tasted it and it's gone around the table and everybody says, oh God, yeah, that's slack malt. You know, it's it's really, really nasty, it's stale. And, and this doesn't taste like that at all. So, uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm still drinking it now. I'm, well, I've got 50 litres of it, so I'm going to carry on drinking it. It's a, the, the only thing is I, I, I couldn't find the protoflock with it, so it's it's looking a bit like a Nipa. So, so I, I suggest one of you, Bruiser Mertzen, makes enough of it. Good, um, good drop of um, caramel in it and enter it as the dunkel and see what your colleagues think of it. I'm too far away to, to be able to judge, but I reckon given all that discussion about how close the styles are, just tinting a Mertzen and see what um, everybody's taste buds think of it. That's, that's a good call. <laughs> you, you can certainly go at the lower gravity and you've got, and you've got that slight overlap. You'd probably get away with it if you're if you, on, on the lower end. So, who's up for it then, Steve? Maybe. <laughs> we wouldn't ask Rob to do it because it goes against his ethos completely. You know? He'd have to adopt a new religion, wouldn't he? <laughs> yeah, the, the Rob boat. <laughs> There's one other thing I was going to ask people their, their ideas on. In terms of like dry yeasts, what do you think would be the best options for, for this kind of, or these kind of styles? Uh, Mango Jacks Munich. Um, you probably wouldn't go over Bavarian wheat. That's, that's going to be a slightly wrong character, but any, um, is, it, is an M20 on a Mango Jacks? I think I've used that before for, for a Dunkel. It's M20, I can't remember. Is the California Lager east, east a bit too neutral? It might be a bit too, I don't know, a bit too clean. Yeah. Yeah, I thought maybe it would be. Could you use a 3470 or something like that? Or is that too clean still? Mm. German, isn't it? German lager yeast. Yeah. Only asking, so I've got two packets of it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try it and see how you feel about it, really. Yeah. Um, I'm happens. asking because I genuinely have no idea. I mean, the one I would probably head towards is um, the S189, um, the Swiss lager yeast, potentially. But yeah, other than that, I have got no idea. That could potentially make an interesting um, kind of comparison if people brewed the same recipe but using different yeasts and then do a taste test and see which one produces the best kind of results. 3470 is interesting too because it does quite well at a bit of a warmer temperature, doesn't it? So you could potentially kind of get away with pseudo lagering in a way. Mm -hmm. So that'd be interesting if it did hold up or something even like Lutra on the whole other end of it, kind of getting into Kvike. Mm -hmm. Then we're going to bring a quake yeast then. Oh, quake <laughs> lager. I got told off for that in the last uh, tasting. <laughs> the purists here. <laughs> hey, if it works. There's a mango, someone would say mango jacks. There's a Bavarian lager mango jacks with that work m76 if you like numbers i reckon for these styles this the flavors are rich enough that i think you they'd probably be pretty forgiving as long as it was a lager yeast mm. uh, whereas you know if you're making a hellas or something light they're probably less forgiving maybe the yeast probably shows through more but i, I reckon you could uh, 
go for a yeah. 3470 you mean i i just you know i think you know so long as it isn't yes you know, so, so, yeah i think you probably get away with a, a big range of lager yeast this is more about the, the malt they're more likely to hide it i, I would have thought mm. 